Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Tales from the Doghouse Separation Anxiety Explained. I am Stacey Bell from Focus to Fun in the U.S., and with me today is... Hello, it's Ness Jones from Australia, from Separation Anxiety in Dogs Decoded. And this episode, we are having a break from our Myth Conceptions series. And we are, have two special guests, um, who is Ali Bender, who's Woo. the co-author of Canine Enrichment for the Real World, and Ellen Yoakum. Ah, oh, Stacey, <laughs> Stacey's got it. Um, Ellen Yoakum, um, who is a fellow um, separation anxiety specialist um, and a trainer, obviously. Um, but today we're going to talk about enrichment because we all know that enrichment is one of the key pillars in helping our dogs resolve their separation anxiety. So Ali and Ellen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Maybe you could both um, give us a little bit about your background, where you're coming from, and uh, then we can dig into the talk. Sure. Thank you so much for having us. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, So I am Ali Bender, founder and co-owner of Pet Harmony Animal Behavior and Training in the States and co-author of Canine Enrichment for the Real World. And as of like a week ago, the Canine Enrichment for the Real World workbook that just came out too. (laughs) I know, it's super exciting. It is. (laughs) Uh, So a little bit about my background. I started off in the animal sheltering world. I started volunteering, interning, working in shelters. Shelters was my life. And uh, at the totally normal age of 13, decided that I wanted to open an animal shelter. Very normal dream for a teenager. And, uh, and so everything I did was for that, all of my jobs and internships, I got a degree in animal science from Iowa State University and uh, was working in a local animal welfare nonprofit after graduation and decided I hated it. I really <laughs> did not want to do that. I did not want to run a nonprofit and was professionally dog training on the side at this point and decided that's really what I wanted to do is I wanted to do training and I loved behavior even when I was thinking of opening a shelter I really wanted to focus on animals with maladaptive behaviors because those are often the ones that fall through the cracks in shelters and rescues and so that that just got me to where I am today. I started full-time professionally training in behavior consulting and here we are. And I'm Ellen Yoakum and I have a less direct path than Ali Bender happens to have. So I got my undergrad at the University of Washington in psychology focusing on animal behavior. But during that time I was working in the behavioral enrichment animal research lab ed by, led by Dr. Eddie Fernandez. And so we did a lot of zoological enrichment research. And that was really the foundation of my undergrad. I worked in dog daycares and dog boarding and all of those things. And then in 2015, my partner and I moved to Florida to go work professionally with birds. <laughs> and so oh. I worked for three, around three years working with birds in a variety of different formats, both in like a zoological and a free flight bird show and all sorts of things. And then in 2018, we moved back to Seattle and I worked at Ahimsa Dog Training for a few years until the pandemic came around. And then my partner took a job in San Jose. We moved down to the Bay Area in California, USA, which is where we're located now. And the (laughs) love of enrichment just kind of guided me towards Pet Harmony. And so I work full time with them now doing behavior consulting and training and Ali's laughing for those of you who may not be able to see. Ellen is being modest. <laughs> Ellen does everything, <laughs> not just training and behavior consulting. This is true. This is true. I'm also affiliated with the University of Washington for their Certificate in Applied Animal Behavior program. Um, I think one of the things that we like to do at the start of a show, especially when we have guests, is um, to define our terms, right? So Enrichment, I think, is one of those terms that's really, really popular in the dog training world right now. And for a lot of people, enrichment equals food toys. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a a much richer, fuller picture. So um, can you guys tell us how you define enrichment? Just before you jump in, um, I've 
a lot of people, not just food toys, they might think it's throwing the ball in the backyard. You know, they come home from work. Oh, what enrichment did you give your dog? Oh, I threw the ball in the backyard for five minutes. Or, you know, they went for a walk or they went to the park or whatever. So, yeah. Go, Ali. Uh, Yeah. So the way that we're defining enrichment is from the zoological world where it originated, where it uh, flourished, I should say. There is a little bit in research before the zoological world. But we're taking our definition from the zoological world in that enrichment allows uh, or enrichment meets all of an animal's needs in order to allow them to perform species typical behaviors in healthy, safe, and appropriate ways. And you mentioned that a lot of people are focused on food puzzles or on just like the physical exercise aspect or the social aspect, but really we're talking about all physical, emotional, and behavioral needs here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that fuller definition because, um, you know, I just, the reason why we want to provide those things for our dogs is to increase their welfare. Right. Um, and, and, and like you said, to meet their needs. And if a dog is not feeling safe, um, but they have a snuffle mat, then, I mean, we're not really, we're not really hitting the nail on the head there. So I think that's one of the, um, the reasons why I just love that fuller definition more instead of breaking it down to exercise and enrichment and then, you know, parsing out those other pieces separately. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's like somebody who's been sleep deprived for three days and you're like, well, I think you need some mental exercise. Here's a crossword puzzle. Like that does (laughs) not, that does not help them in that moment. We need to look at what do you need right now? Let me provide that for you. And then, especially because I'm sure we'll be talking about separation anxiety shortly, Mm -hmm. then that allows us to help them in other ways down the road. You know, let's let the sleep deprived person sleep for a moment and then we can address their mental exercise needs, similar to how we do with separation anxiety of let's look at unmet needs first so that we have a a better internal environment that we can work with, with that animal. And then we can work on the separation anxiety aspect. I guess one of the, the things that I really love about your book is the astute discussion of um, safety versus security. And, and I just love that because it's so easy to lose our compassion for our animals and go down that road of, oh, they can suck it up. They're just being a baby or, you know, like any of that negative kind of self-talk when we don't look at safety and security separately and then kind of see how how they kind of um how we can work on both of those aspects right so um can you just for our listeners who haven't read the book can you um talk about that a little bit for us absolutely this is one of my favorite topics as a behavior consultant working with clients as well because it, like you said it is such an important concept for pet parents to understand and the way we're defining that is safety means they are physically out of harm's way, whereas security is the feeling that you are safe and out of harm's way. So one of the examples that we give is uh, an animal who, a, a dog who is running in traffic and having the best time of their life <laughs> feels <laughs> secure. They feel like they're fine and free and, and what have you, but they're not physically safe. They're not physically out of harm's way. Whereas when we're talking about something like separation anxiety, they are physically safe. There's like that big asterisk of like, unless there's self mutilation and (laughs) and all of that, but they are physically safe, but they definitely do not feel safe. And I guess that's one of the the big reasons why in uh, home alone training, one of the most important things is to take away that that fear and, and kind of put it on the back burner and say, Hey, we're not going to expose you to home alone absences that are longer than you can feel comfortable doing. Right. So we're going to take that away and kind of build up from what are you comfortable with now? And then, you know, gradually desensitize them to, to the, um, longer and longer durations. 
Um, another kind of thread that runs through your book is the discussion on agency. And of course, I love that as well. Um, the whole book, I mean, honestly, y'all, if you have not read it, no. Ness is going to now I'll make no. me, she makes fun of me every time I say y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do that in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you have not read the book, I would highly recommend it. I will show it to the people who are looking. And I can't wait to just, I know that this is a side street. Oh, uh, yeah. Yay. Um, if you, what's, what's going on with the uh, workbook? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I didn't even know that was coming. There's a whole story. <laughs> behind. <laughs> we didn't know exactly the date it was coming either. And, and yes, but it, it is here as of like a week ago. Uh, so our book came out and uh, had better, better reviews. Like, you know, people liked it more than we thought they would, you know, we, Emily and I prepared a lot for what if people hate it and run us out of the profession and what are we going to do after behavior consulting when, you know, our names are that tarnished. Sounds, that sounds so, familiar. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Like imposter syndrome hits us all. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that did not happen. And we never prepared for what would happen if people actually liked it. Uh, but, you know, we've had we've been so fortunate in that we've been able to present and be on podcasts and just talk to people about enrichment for what three ish years that the book's been out now, I think, cause it was pre pandemic. Um, so three ish years that the book's been out and or four it's, it's not relevant, but, but we've been so fortunate to be able to talk with people and the biggest questions that we got, uh, aside from agency questions, we got a ton of agency questions, but one of the biggest questions we got was about the implementation of all of this. And so a lot of what we've been focused on since hearing everybody and, and hearing all of those questions has been, okay, how do we help people implement this enrichment framework for their personal pets, for their clients, for shelters and rescues, for doggy daycares. You know, we have a lot of different people who have asked us for help and implementation. And so a lot of the things we've worked on have been for that. We have our enrichment masterclass for professionals to teach professionals mm -hmm. how to use this with their clients. Uh, and the workbook was another answer to this of, okay, let's break down the process. Essentially that chapter six, 17 ish, I think it is, where it's putting it all together. I, I could also try mm. to get my copy that's right next to me. Yes, chapter 17 of putting it all together of let's just blow up that chapter and look at all the nitty gritty details about how to implement. And that's what the workbook is, is here's a step-by-step -step guide of how to implement our enrichment framework and has resources and worksheets and all of that good sort of stuff to help people do that. Um, I love it. I'd, I'd love really it. like to touch on um, something we haven't discussed yet. And um, Ellen, if you'd like to join in as well, um, why or how can enrichment benefit dogs that are struggling with behavioural problems? And then maybe Ellen, you can talk about separation anxiety in particular. I'm going to let Ellen <laughs> answer this whole question because <laughs> I have been talking way too much. So Ellen, please take the whole thing away. Yeah. I, I, for those of you that can't see, because podcasts, I just laughed. Yeah, I was wondering what you were laughing at. Because <laughs> this is, this is everything that we do. This is how we approach things at Pet Harmony from the ground up. Because often when we're seeing these maladaptive or these behavior struggles or challenges or whatever word resonates with you, we're seeing some sort of indication that there is an unmet need of some way, shape or form. We always start with the, this is the most likely answer and then dive a little bit deeper if we're not getting the results that we're looking for. So when we're utilizing enrichment activities and strategies, we're really looking for results. I'm not looking for, can I fill my dog's time? Sometimes I'm looking for, can I fill my dog's time? Because sometimes mom needs a break, but I'm more often looking for if for example, I have my dog Griffy, who <laughs> if you've seen anything, he has some big feels about a lot of stuff, um, one of which was separation problems for a while. Um, 
but we have a dog next door that I call sad dog and sad dog barks and Griffey is very responsive to dogs in distress for whatever reason he can handle other dogs barking, but dogs that are giving distress barks, he finds also equally distressing. But if I do 15 minutes of scent work with him in the morning, I get a reduction in 50% less barking from him towards the other dogs in the neighborhood. So that's really effective for me. I know that that is a trade that I can make 15 minutes of scent work gets me 50% less barking throughout the day. That's a huge win for me. So we're looking to see, can I meet some sort of unmet need that will help us address these things? And instead of trying to just deal with the symptoms, can we deal with the root cause that's going to give us something that is sustainable long-term that the pet parent and the pet can sustain so that we're getting that change that's going to last us. And it's not so fragile. We're not walking on eggshells trying to maintain some sort of chaotic balance that we've all struck in our household together. And and one of the things that I really, really love about um, your framework is that it is a framework, right? It's not just throwing spaghetti at a wall and saying, well, today I did this, tomorrow I'm going to do this, and the next day I'm going to do this, and hopefully something will work. It's it's much more systematic than that. And like kind of going through, this is what I'm doing, and these are the behaviors that I'm seeing. What if I tweak this? What happens with the behaviors that I'm seeing? And really looking at that, um, because I think you can get into that, well, we'll just keep on adding stuff. And then all of a sudden, everybody's feeling so overwhelmed because now they've got to do 15 things per day before they can even try a home alone exercise. And then they just, you know, it just, that, like you said, it's not sustainable. I just think that that's super important because we're all doing the best we can <laughs> with the information that we have. And it can be really easy. We call it the enrichment guilt because we see it so often people it tends to be on social media where they see these like beautifully curated and crafted enrichment plans. And like, I'm going to be honest, my enrichment plan is not beautiful in any way, shape or form. It is messy. There's cardboard all over my house because that's <laughs> what's effective for my dogs. And I may or may not have the ability to pick it up right after they do things. So it's really important to strike that balance for <laughs> everybody in the household. Because if yes. the humans struggle in, they can't help their pet. So we could expect people that say, let's talk about separation anxiety. Um, they've got a dog that's suffering from separation anxiety. Um, maybe, hope you know, if they start adding an enrichment, then it might just help facilitate the training in some in some way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we can also broaden our idea of what enrichment is. If we think back to the definition that Allie gave, that it is things that meet all of an animal's needs. Animals need autonomy and independence. That is, independence is one of the categories that is outlined in canine enrichment for the real world. And that home alone training or that can you be comfortable despite what the crazy world is going to, wild world is going to throw at you. When I'm not present, can we have other ways for you to feel safe and secure that are non-dependent on me is addressing more than just the independence category of welfare and needs. It's so many other things. And I think that we, we do try to, as I was kind of going through the different categories, I was trying to, you know, look at the the kind of typical starting place for home alone training and and try to see like are we providing as much agency as we can in this case you know getting them out of the crate letting them choose where um they might rest during a session are we um you know when we're doing those you know sniffy walks or whatever we're doing um are we letting them choose where to go? Are we, you know, so I was really trying to look at um, some of the different things and, and trying to, you know, just challenge myself to look for more ways, you know, kind of taking the status quo. Are there more ways that we can um, add agency, add independence or increase that skill, particularly for these dogs? Can we 
help um, change the environment a little bit more to make it um, more conducive for restfulness for that dog, or if the dog is noise phobic, or if um, the dog um, has overreactions to other dogs and other people, can we, you know, all of those things that we normally do, can we take those to the next level for our clients um, and, and kind of help them, and, you know, every situation is different. So I'm not saying we're, we're making a formula here, but just to open our minds to, to more possibilities, uh, more ways of supporting our clients. Um, so that's what I was hoping that you guys could just um, help challenge us in that, um, not in a confrontational way, but in a growing way. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And one that I, I I think all of us as professionals should be asking ourselves and each other of just how can we get better every day at what we do? Mm -hmm. So I love that question. Um, for me, one of the things that I am currently focusing on uh, growing and being better at with my clients is sustainability and efficiency of, is there a faster, easier way to get the same result than this thing that might be a little bit more intense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so really that's what I'm, uh, I'm looking at. And I think when it comes to separation anxiety, that's something that as an industry we can be looking at is, is there a way to get faster, more efficient results? Because separation anxiety notoriously takes yes. a long time to work it on. Does. And, and it's not to say that we'll be able to do anything in a day or a week or anything. like it, it does take a long time to work on any maladaptive behavior, but is there a way to get faster results with that. So that's really what I'm focusing on with a lot of that um, and focusing on how can I use the least amount of information and exercises for my clients to get them what they need. You know, if I can give them a, a bunch of information to get to 95% of what I want them to be. Could I give them a little bit of information to get them to 90%? And, and the answer mm -hmm. is, yeah, <laughs> it can be a, a little bit of information and very few exercises to get to the 90%. And, and they're, you know, they would have been happy at 75% of, right. of, right. of results. So that's really where I'm focusing on personally. Yeah. I think that we're both in that same that same vein and part of what's so great about working on a team is <laughs> message anyone on the team and be like, I need someone to check me. Like, am I, am I going way out of left field here? Does this seem like it's a decent idea? Should I pursue this and see if it will work? And I will say that things as simple as adjusting your phrasing, if you're a behavior consultant helping families, Looking at the language that you are using can make a huge difference yeah. without you having to change your approach or the recommendations that you are making. So I used to talk about calm a lot. I've stopped talking about calm because it was not very effective for me in the way that I teach and coach and do all of those things. So I talk about de-escalation because wherever you are from lungy barky bitey at the end of the leash all the way down to I'm laying and I'm not quite asleep and all of those things we still have a step down to that really comfy cozy I am zen and I am happy and I am just blissful right now and that slight change has made a huge difference for a lot of the people that I work with and has gotten them faster results because they're focusing on the thing that is more important than what I was actually communicating so that's where I'm spending a lot of my time lately because like we said, there is only so much in terms of the time that I can, can speed up. Some of it is just repetition and making sure that mm -hmm. we're creating that mm -hmm. safe and secure place. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I think it's, you know, people who have dogs that have maladaptive behaviors or behavioral struggles or, you know, however you want to label them are already overwhelmed, right? So mm -hmm. if we can streamline the process, um, make it more efficient, make it um, less bulky, um, 
then, you know, not only is their stress level going down and their overwhelm going down, but then they're in a better position to say, these are the three things I need to do today. Or, you know, and that just seems so much more attainable and sustainable. Um, so I think that's really great. Um, one of the things that, um, I have actually two clients right now that I'm kind of working with on this. And I, I just wanted to get your uh, feedback is um, we know that routine helps anxious dogs, especially, but, and let's go with, and um, it can also be a little bit of a thorn in the side because some Sometimes that routine shifts just a little bit and it throws their whole day off. So I've been working on a plan to add a little bit of flexibility in the, in the routine. Um, so I'm not saying um, like, so this is our time when we would usually do tug. Well, maybe we can do the floor pole. It's the same type of intense activity, but it is something different. Um, and then just trying to spread that a little bit and add a little bit of um, diversity in there. Do you all see that with your clients? And if so, what what are your big tips and, and takeaways there? Yeah, I have a client right now that that's exactly what we're working on. They're not a separation anxiety client, but uh, they have a Malinois that has big feelings and we like Malinois. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have three. <laughs> right, like this beautiful picture right by, by yeah. here. Um, so they they have a Mal who has big feelings, and the big feelings often result in redirection on the woman in the house. Ooh. And it, yeah, it's it's um it's not a great you know coping mechanism that he has, and much better than he was a few a few months ago, but we're, we're working now. Um, and now they've realized, okay, a lot of this has been resolved. And the sticky point at the moment is when his routine changes. If we have routine changes in the morning, he has big feels about that. And that just kind of throws him for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And he has a hard time and is much more likely to redirect on those days. And I get it. I, if my routine gets thrown in the morning, I'm also similar to that. So I should take a note for myself on this, but, <laughs> uh, but for this now, one of the things we're doing is saying, okay, what are his needs in the morning? Because we do still have to feed him and exercise him and do all right. of those things. Uh, and he does enjoy affection from the woman in the morning, but sometimes that can get dicey. So how do we meet his needs? How do we meet their needs? And then how do we plan for reasonable contingencies? So we found a routine in the morning that works for him. And then we said, okay, what happens if uh, the, the man in this relationship is not able to care for him that morning? He's sick or he's on vacation, you know, like on a work trip or something like that, because the morning routine is very heavy on the man being able to do all of those things. And so now what we're working on is very gradually, very small approximations so that we are not upsetting this, this dog, uh, working on the woman being able to do more of those things, you know, instead of the man being able to recall the dog away from her, if he's getting a little weird with her, can she send him to his place or into his crate mm. or, you know, can she play fetch with him? You know, how can she get the same results? It, you know, if, uh, if he can't go on for a walk in the morning, what options do we have in the house? We have a nice big basement. We can play in the basement. So just like mm -hmm. you were saying, Stacy, of, um, you know, maybe it's not fetch, maybe we do flirt pull or maybe we do tug or, you know, let's still look at, meeting the needs that are there, but have options that everybody is okay with so that no matter what the circumstance is, we can just pick and choose things that are going to work for that particular situation. And, and for this client, that's knock on wood, we're doing really well with good, good switching his routine over and broadening it a little bit. And for a lot of my clients, I try to focus less on routine and more on predictability. So the difference there is mm. routine for me is unintentional predictability. <laughs> so for example, I moved here in 
Um, April of 2020, my partner and I moved from Seattle to the Bay Area. And at the time I was not working. And so my partner got off around 5, 530. Around 5 o'clock, I would get up and start cleaning the house. I'd play with the dogs. I would make dinner, do all of the things, kind of shift into evening time routine for me. What I started noticing when I started working full time again is that five o'clock hit and my dogs were in my office play bowing and batting each other in the face and bringing me wubbas <laughs> and doing all of these things because I created a predictable routine around five o'clock <laughs> that we play, we do these things. And that's, I mean, I would, most days I would like that to be totally accessible to us, but it is not every day. So instead of creating that routine around that time, I started implementing like, do you want to play? When I say, do you mm -hmm. want to play? And I walk into the room and I sit on the ground. That is the initiation of if this is something you would like to participate in, then let's do it now. Do you want to go outside? Do you, we play the, do you want a game <laughs> so that I'm able to implement all of these different things. Now to relate that back to separation training, this is something I suggest to a lot of my clients when the dog is hypervigilant of the client's movement around the home. Because often what we see is that it is, does this matter to me? Does this one matter to me? Does this one matter to me? Maybe right. they're gonna, are they going to the cheese drawer? Are they going outside? Are we gonna go for a walk? Are we gonna do all these things? So it pays for your dog to pay attention to you all the time because they wanna make sure that they're engaged when they're able to be engaged. So if we start to label those things or build in predictable movements, I will be very right. deliberate in the way that I walk to your leash. If this is about you, then my dog can take time off <laughs> and sleep and rest mm -hmm. and relax and not worry about, maybe she's going to the cheese drawer. Can I get some cheese? I'll follow her to the kitchen every time because one out of 10 times it ends up in cheese. And like, I really yeah. love cheese. <laughs> Me this too. is Me not too. at all oh, what I happened mean, in my house. It's been about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we can build in that predictability without creating those really structured time-based routines. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm working with a behavior consultant, Sarah McLeodry, for care with consent. And we've been implementing this a lot with my own dogs in terms of husbandry. Oh, one thing that you said, Allie, that, um, you know, kind of when we were talking about that, um, you know, making sure that the needs are met and I have, um, the same client <laughs> that is very sensitive to the weather. So if it's too hot or too cold, <laughs> she, she struggles. So she struggles, um, being outside. She's a greyhound in case that helps put it in perspective. Um, she's just sensitive and, um, lovely in so many ways. And she, um, so we have started trying to look at different ways that she might find engaging to do some exercise inside. Right. So she, she does, you know, a lot of mental enrichment types of things that we can do inside, obviously, but the, um, physical stuff is usually outside. So we're trying to bring that inside, like you were saying with your, um, client who, you know, plays in the basement. Um, so, um, but the tricky thing is if people don't have carpeted floors, <laughs> because the, the slippery floors can make it hard for things like tug and fetch and, you know, all of those things that can be kind of, um, dangerous or uncomfortable or both. Um, so, um, I didn't know if you had any besides kind of the normal, um, I'm kind of trying to think of that, um, kind of high and in higher intensity exercise ideas, but things that might be like a short time outside or be able to play inside. Um, do y'all have any ideas besides kind of, I know there's like lots of training games and fetch and tug and, um, you can't, Slur pulls hard inside for, with a big dog, but <laughs> unless you have a huge basement or something, but um, what are your ideas on that? Sure. And I'll preface this with every dog's an individual. Talk to your yes. vet, blah, 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 because mm -hmm. don't at me yes. people on Instagram for these <laughs> recommendations. Um, <laughs> so, um, so uh, it, like fetch and tug and flirt pull and all that. But one of the things to think about too is like, like you said, flare pulls hard for big dogs. And so one of the biggest things that I recommend for folks is 
look at your dog specifically instead of taking like necessarily blanket recommendations, you know, because right. for small dogs, like I've had people with small dogs who have used just like cat wand toys as yes. holes and they can do it in yes. an apartment, like a mm-hmm. really small apartment. So, you know, so there are a lot of things that are available depending on the size of the animal, you know, the health of them and and all of that. So um, anything that we can do outside, trying to repurpose that inside if it's safe to do so. Um, I like stairs for a lot of that. If that's a good idea. If you have stairs, (laughs) yeah, if you have stairs, if, you know, they don't have joint issues and all of that, if they're a healthy Mm -hmm. animal, um, you know, making sure, and a lot of people have carpeted stairs, which is even better. You know, I've Mm -hmm. always lived in places that have fully carpeted stairs. Um, and, um, and it, you know, if it's one of those where it's like a stair runner and there's nothing at the bottom putting, you know, a, a really staple rug at the bottom for them, but, you know, being able to just stand at the top, toss a treat down the stairs, have them go get the treat, come back up for another treat. That's a really simple one. Uh, jumping up and off of furniture. If it's somebody who is, able to do that. You need kind of like the mm-hmm. right size of dog for, the, for that recommendation to work. Um, if, um, if they know how to do place and recalls and all of that, those are great things that, uh, training exercises that you can do. I do that the lazier way where I just incorporate it into my find it exercise. Uh, mm. so there's mental exercise and physical exercise of so love we don't the double have stairs, right yeah yeah we don't have stairs that my dog can uh can go up and down that are more than three stairs which is not super helpful so uh so we have a long hallway in our house and I toss a treat down the hallway he goes grabs it comes back does find it goes and grabs the treat down the hallway and so on um if they know how to do um any training exercises that can also double as physical exercises, again, with vet blessings and based on their body shape and all of that sort of stuff, you know, things like army crawl and sit pretty and different physical therapy exercises. Um, But I think one of the hard things and the thing to keep in mind for indoor exercises is that a lot of times when people say that indoor exercise, physical exercise doesn't work is because they've missed the cardio component of it. Right. You know, so they're inside and they're like, well, I'm doing like physical therapy exercises and it's not having the same result as it is outside. It's like, yeah, <laughs> because you're working on, yeah. on stretching and, and strength and you're not working on cardio. And even for us humans, all of those things have different effects on our energy levels. Right. So, right. Um, so there's definitely a balance to find safe ways to do cardio inside. So yeah, that's my answer. Jumping jacks. If they could just do jumping jacks. Right. Right. I mean, you can do, I guess like puppy push-ups really fast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, some some dogs, <laughs> I was going to say, some dogs willingly do that <laughs> without prompting. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's funny. How important do you think sniffing is then? Like tell our listeners where sniffing comes into the equation for their dogs. Foundational. I'm going to, I'm going to let Ellen answer this (laughs) because she literally today was like rattling off different (laughs) sniffing studies. So (laughs) I'm just going to let you continue that conversation you're having, Ellen. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, Really big. So that is something that I start almost all, not all, but almost all of my clients with for a couple of reasons. One, it's multi-purpose. So I can use it in a bunch of different ways. If I have a cue that says, put your nose to the ground and sniff, there's stuff for you. I can use it as a multi-tool. Somebody called it the duct tape of dog trainer. And I was like, yeah, like that, that sticks, (laughs) that stays. Um, So one, it's super useful. And back to the, can I get you 90% of the way there with very little find it for me as one of those that I can get you pretty close to your goals with one or two exercises. We just have to teach them really well. So one, very, very functional. 
two, I came from a background in um, zoological enrichment where we were really looking at, can we use species typical behaviors? So whatever that animal is, can we utilize that to increase welfare? And if we look at dog, sniffing is about the doggiest dog thing a dog can do. So when we are harnessing that for good, then we can see a lot of really good effects. So back to <laughs> things that Ali was mentioning earlier, um, I believe it was an Alexandra Horowitz paper a while ago that looked at judgment bias and the way that sniffing can impact judgment bias. And yes. it was for the good, <laughs> as we would put it, dogs that engaged in sniffing as a regular activity. They had parameters in the study. It was much more concrete than what I am reporting here saw that dogs were shifting from a negative judgment bias to a positive judgment bias. So that means in an ambiguous situation, they were maybe apprehensive, their body language was low, they might have been avoidant, they might have been moving very slowly or really ignoring a lot of the environment versus post-sniffing implementation. We saw, they saw more exploration or what we would kind of label as an optimist. A dog that came in and was like, until proven otherwise, this is probably good for me. And so we really want that for a lot of our dogs. There's also some research because I really focus on self-regulation, physiological self-regulation as a crux of my separation training. Can I help the dog be able to do the, I'm going to be honest, I'm better at it with dogs than I am myself. It is what it is. <laughs> But there's also some research out there that indicates that sniffing can help jumpstart that physiological reset, that process of the dog de-escalating and being able to self-regulate and self-soothe and do all of those things. So sniffing, do it. It's yeah. great. Yes. That being said, yes. not all sniffing is the same and not all dogs are going to respond to all sniffing in the same way. So if your dog is not a super big fan of find it, meaning you're not seeing the results that you're looking for, try something else. Try more directed sniffing rather than that. Like there's just stuff, go find it. You might have more results with that. So talk to us more about the physiological regulation that you were, that you were talking about as part of your separation anxiety training. Yeah, because well, we could all do it. Um, <laughs> we did a podcast episode with Dr. Pockle really focused on relaxation and oh, that self-regulation <laughs> and being fans. able, he's, he's great. Um, having the dog be able to initiate that process on their own or with minimal guidance from us, because by definition, if you're working on separation training, you're not there. Your dog needs to be able to cope with things on their own. That's how you get that that independence. So we really focus on maybe some up down games. Can I get you a little excited with the flirt pull? And then can I help you with a find it so that we're getting a little excited and then we're taking a deep breath or when something happens, can I help you that way? We really focus. I coach my clients to really focus on those physiological signs that are kind of across the animal kingdom. So increased respiration, increased heart rate, the dilated pupils, all of those signs that we might be up headed towards that fight, flight, or freeze threshold? And then can we start to come back down? Can I coach you or guide you in a way that is going to help you bring all of those things back down, find you safety and security? So do you do a lot of um, kind of trying to capture deep breaths or sniffing or and in, in giving, putting that on cue then and to try to introduce that as a, as a way that the yeah. dog can kind of, okay. Yeah, it really depends on each individual and where they are, both dog and human. Where are we in this process? I give them a couple of ideas for possible enrichment activities. And then I give them very concrete parameters of this is what success looks like. This is the goal that I am trying to achieve by doing these activities. Report back. Let me know how this goes so that I can help you create that sustainable and realistic plan, that thing that you can do every day that doesn't take a huge amount of effort from you <laughs> is my goal. Sometimes we have to put some effort into get there the other way. And then really capturing those signs of, I call them de-escalation because again, that language works for me. Mm -hmm. So it might be a shake off. It might be a deep breath. It might be a tail going from straight up to slightly starting to lower, or it might be that snap to attention and that moment where your dog goes, Never mind, and disengages from the thing. So we're looking at all of those 
And then if we take it a step further, we can also take a video of our dog as they're going to sleep. So how does your dog put themselves to sleep at the end of the day? What does that process look like? For my dog, there's usually some digging, especially for jazz. That's part of his process. We dig and then we circle, we lay down and he'll do some grooming. And then I start to see his forehead loosened. And then I start to see his eyes get droopy. And he takes a couple of deep breaths and I see a yawn and some tongue flicks and lip licks and all of those things as he's getting prepared to fall asleep. And then the last thing, the thing that tells me (laughs) I'll see you in the morning is he takes a big deep breath and goes, (sighs) and I can just watch his entire body deflate into the bed. So I know that those are all things that he naturally does to self-regulate, to get himself prepared for sleep meaning I can capture Mm -hmm. those in day-to-day life and they'll hopefully work in our favor if we do everything in the right order. I think uh, my, my biggest thing is that each dog is an individual and Ellen mentioned earlier that we need to be looking at results from our enrichment plan. And we need to take that objective lens of if something isn't working and isn't producing the results that we wanted it to, of being willing to experiment with that exercise to see, can we get it to have results? Or is this just not the right thing to do with our dog in the first place? And recognizing that what works for one dog is not going to work for another dog and being willing to let go of some of those woulda, coulda, shouldas, and just looking at the dog in front of us and doing what they need. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I think excellent. to build off of that, we had a, one of our consultants wrote a blog where she called it trial and eval instead of trial uh-huh. and error. And that mindset shift for our clients has been huge. I have clients that are like, well, I tried this thing. And I got this information. So I try a leading valve and it's not it. It's not the right choice or for whatever reason, it's not going to work for us. And so instead of saying, I tried this thing and it was a waste of time, it was a waste of resources, all of these things, instead turn around and say, what did I learn from that? Did I learn right. that my dog really isn't a huge fan of silicone lick mats? Cool. I don't have to buy a silicone lick mat ever again. I can do mm-hmm. something else. I do love that because it, it, gives us permission to explore without feeling like we failed at something, right? Because, because like you said, every dog is different. They're individuals, right? So we can try things. And I always do try to, I'm, I'm gonna, definitely going to start using that terminology because I always do try to frame things like, let's try this first. And if we find that we're not getting the results we're looking for, we'll try something different. But I like that trial and eval is just a kind of shorter way of saying, I tend to be a little wordy. Ness will attest. Um, So that's a nice short way to kind of, um, you know, get that capture that whole concept is that, you know, kind of that staying curious about things, keeping an open mind, exploring, um, because the bottom line is that we are trying to meet the needs of the dog and every dog is going to have different needs. So um, I love that. Very nice. Where can um, everybody find you? Absolutely. We are Pet Harmony Training pretty much everywhere. Our website's PetHarmonyTraining.com. We're at Pet Harmony Training, Facebook and Instagram. For pet professionals, we are at Pet Harmony Pro on Instagram. And for folks who want to get a free uh, copy of our enrichment chart, blank enrichment chart to fill out and a guide to go along with that, which is like a little a baby, a bridge version of the workbook, you can go to petharmonytraining.com forward slash enrichment part for that. Lovely. Lovely. Well, thank you guys both for, for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here and everybody get the book. It's awesome. It's awesome. Even if you feel like you know a lot about enrichment, you will learn things and it will kind of, um, remind you of things that you might have slipped on and and help you kind of whether you're a professional or um a a pet parent it's it's awesome highly recommend thank you so much for having us it's been great of course it was great thank you 
Yeah, thank you. Thanks. My dogs were just going off in the background there. I don't know. You can hear <laughs> some weird noises. <laughs> They're a bit bored. It's um, it's now oh, just after six thirty in the morning, so. They're in their active kind of, come on, mum, yeah. let's go and do something. <laughs> yep. Activity time. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it is activity time. Yeah, but thank you. It's been uh, such an interesting conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having us. Fabulous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, we might wind, well, wind up. Um, thank you for listening to another episode of Tales from the Doghouse, Separation Anxiety Explained. I'm Ness Jones. I am in Australia from Separation Anxiety in Dogs Decoders. And I am Stacey Bell with Focus Fun in the US. Thanks for joining us. Bye. See ya.